Okay. okay. Hey, welcome and thanks everyone for joining this session. And uh, we're back uh, with the Data Cloud Deep Dive series. Uh, this is the series number five. And today we have Sandesh. Uh, he's going to walk us through the integration of Data Cloud using the Ingestion API. So every Tuesday for the next four weeks, we have uh, the deep dive series sessions scheduled at the same time, 8 a.m. Eastern. And the next week, next Tuesday, it is about streamlining data unification with Data Cloud by Michelle. And on May 28th, we have marketing driven actions, how to make data actionable within the Data Cloud by Tim. And on June 4th, we have marketing cloud personalization and Data Cloud, how they work in tandem together. That is by Jacob. And on June 11, uh, about the data cloud implementation, best practices and requirements planning, we have funny to go over that. So you can find all these uh, published on the Phoenix user group event page. I will share that in the chat shortly. So as you all know, uh, these uh, sessions are recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel. All the previous sessions, as well as the upcoming, and as well as this session, will be recorded and uploaded to the same YouTube channel at the rate MC Learning Camp. If you have any questions during the session, please post them in the chat. And if you have any positive news that you want to share with us, uh, we'll be happy. Uh, we'll be celebrating it together. Please uh, post that in the chat as well. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Sandesh. I think I'm done. Please take it. Thank you, JB. And thanks, everyone, for uh, coming into this session. Today, we'll be diving deep into the ingestion API and how, um, how to configure data cloud so that you can programmatically push data into data cloud. This is the fifth session, as Xavi mentioned, in the deep dive series. Um, so thanks for, thanks for continuing to join. If you are an old participant or uh, if you are a new audience, welcome. Um, let's start. I am Sandesh. I'm currently located in Baton Rouge. I'm a developer at Cervelo. Um, we do a lot of development around the Salesforce ecosystem, but also do some custom application development. I have put my Trailblazer and LinkedIn profile in there, so please feel free to connect. All right, so today's agenda. Um, we'll start with some basic review of data cloud and ingestion. Therein, we'll talk about BATS versus streaming ingestion API and how the ingestion API differs or has what similarities it has with the web mobile SDK. And some of this has already been covered by previous speakers, but these are fundamental concepts and um, always a good idea to review. Then we'll move on to the financial services use case that today's demo is going to be based on. And um, some of my colleagues from Cervelo are, will also be presenting based on the same use case in the next two sessions. Then we'll see how to set up the connector and the data stream. But before we do that, we also uh, touch briefly on the importance of planning and getting an inventory of your data before actually uh, preparing for the connector and data stream setup. But within the setup, we'll, we'll talk about the YAML schema file, and also briefly mention the difference between profile and engagement categories and their importance in ingestion. Finally, we'll talk about the integration setup because just setting up data cloud is not enough to make an API call to data cloud. If you have worked with Salesforce on any external application integration, you'll know that you first need to vet the external application by building a connected app. Um, and today we'll look at building that connected app with digital certificate. Um, we'll not go very deeply into that, um, but we might be covering that in our hands-on session on Thursday. So please join that one um, if you wanna look at how to actually build that hands-on on the platform. And uh, finally, we'll also look at the integration user permission sets, time permitting. Um, again, we will look at this definitely on Thursday. Uh, but today I wanted to mention that because that's an important co component in building and getting that integration set up. So with the agenda set, I wanna get started right away. Um, so basics of data cloud and ingestion API, just to review. Um, data cloud is a platform 
to aggregate customer data. And you have data in multiple sources. Um, maybe there, there is overlapping customer information in that and Data Cloud allows you to ingest data from all the sources to get a unified or a 360 degree view of the customers. And in Data Cloud, the pipeline generally runs in this manner. You connect the sources, you standardize data, which means mapping your sources to the data model, and you merge your profiles. If you have overlapping customer profiles and different sources, you merge them, um, again, to make a unified view of the customers. Then you run, run some algorithms um, to the data, right? Because that's the primary purpose of getting data in. You want to extract some insights that you can potentially act on. And you can do this start to finish in Data Cloud. Now, where, do, where does ingestion fit in? Of course, at the beginning, where you are trying to get data to the, in the platform in the first place. And this being the start of the process in Data Cloud, this impacts everything downstream. So it's very important to understand the intricacies between um, picking, for example, bats versus ingestion, uh, sorry, streaming API, you know, which connector to use, how do you set up the connector, um, how does the schema file um, affect the ingestion? Things like that are important because all the data that you ingest, all the settings that you make at the beginning will affect the pipeline, will affect the data model, will affect your activations, transformations, and things like that. Um, data Cloud has the capability to connect to many different sources, the CRM, Marketing Cloud, Amazon S3. You can also connect to Google Ads for activations. Um, but today, the focus of the session is the ingestion API. And this is especially powerful because it allows you to programmatically ingest data, which means that you can make any custom integration work. Whatever you want to ingest, be it a CSV file of your choosing or a stream payload in an API, you can do that. You can do that with any external, external application. It doesn't matter the stack of your application, what platform the application is in, as long as it, as long as it has the capability of making an API call, then you can ingest data from that platform. And you also, not only you have the full control of what is ingested, but you also have full control of when they're ingested, right? Because if you're just making an API call, you can decide when you are making that call on a schedule, on, um, you want to act on specific customer interactions, you have you have the control. I have a little star there because Data Cloud has its own schedule to process ingested data. So yes, you can call the API whenever you might want to, but Data Cloud has its own job that runs every three minutes for ingestion API, and that's when your data will surface in the Data Cloud environment. But three minutes is still still pretty fast. And these latencies are increasing, improving. Um, as data cloud matures. Okay, so let's jump in and see the difference between batch and streaming ingestion. And this is particularly related to the ingestion API, of course. Um, there are two differences, and I have little diagrams to show the data flow uh, on the right there. The top one is the uh, batch data flow, and the bottom one is the stream one. And these are Totally simplified views, but I thought they would be helpful in understanding the differences between them in terms of how data is flowing from the users to Data Cloud. So on the bats, we have user actions that goes to your application backend. And on a schedule, the data is pulled in from your database or from any anything really, depending on your application architecture. On a schedule, it's pulled in, it's converted into a CSV format, and then you probably have some API service that connects to Data Cloud. Um, so that's bad. And but in streaming, you have the user actions going to the database, but there is no no delay. You immediately call the API service that calls in turn calls the Data Cloud APIs, and the little dotted arrow in there, um, in the bottom one is an alternative route where. Maybe you even skip the database and you use your actions directly communicate with the API service. And that's even faster depending on your use case. Um, now that's the data flow. Um, the difference in use cases, however, is that batch is generally used to front load data cloud. 
uh, say you are implementing your data cloud today, uh, which means you don't have any of your existing customer data in data cloud, and you probably want them there. In that case, you would use a batch pipeline to, to load all of the, that existing data before you, um, before you ingest any more data incrementally as you go. The other use case for bats is to ingest large volumes at regular intervals or off peak hours. Maybe your system, your your application system is clogged during uh, during the day, and there is a specific window, say three a.m. to four a.m., where the backend is actually capable of pushing data to data cloud. That would be a great use case. You would aggregate all of your application data throughout the day throughout the previous day, and then you would push everything in batch to data cloud. Streaming API, in contrast, is used to ingest real-time chunks. So whenever anything happens, and generally real-world events, this could be user actions on your applications or POS systems, um, or it could be things like weather data or any other data that's not really related to users, but they are often initiated by real-world events. So excuse me, uh, the user, say a user signs up, you immediately want to push that information to data cloud. Maybe a user calls your service agent. You want to push that information directly so that other agents will see that data with relatively uh, low latency, three to five minutes. Um, we also wanted to mention that batch ingestion in data cloud is no different than ingesting in bats into the Salesforce platform. And that was an existing feature before data cloud, right? If you wanted to ingest anything, bulk load data into Salesforce, you would go through the typical job creation, CSV upload and job close flow. And with that, you could you could upload any CSV file data that you that you wanted to. And these pipelines, bats versus streaming, needs to be carefully considered because they have different they have different impact on the credit multipliers. So if you look at the uh, credit multiplier sheet that's directly pulled in from the official sheet that's available, you can see that the BATS pipeline has 2000 as the multiplier per 1, 000, 1 million rows processed, whereas the streaming one has 5,000. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily mean that BATS will always be cheaper, right? Because you also have data volume. BATS means you probably are ingesting more. Uh, more volume data, but streaming um, is free, more frequent. So definitely need need to sit down with your requirements team and then and then uh, consider all these multipliers before picking a pipeline. All right, mobile web SDK versus the ingestion API. Uh, first, a fundamental difference. I thought this was worth calling out because both of these can be thought of as mediums that transmit your real world events. For example, user actions to data cloud, right? You could, do, you could do this with both ingestion API and mobile web SDK, but there is a fundamental difference in their use cases and how the data actually flows. So let's start with um, how this works. So the previous ones, be it bats or, in, or streaming, the flow is the same, right? The user makes some action, in your application, you push that data to your application backend, and then the backend actually calls data cloud. It calls it on a schedule or immediately calls it, it doesn't matter, it's the backend that's doing the job of calling the calling data cloud APIs. Here, however, you have an SDK that you inject into your application UI. So if you have a website, you, you put a tag, it's just like Google Analytics, and then that tag injects a JavaScript into your front end, and that SDK, um, you also need to write a sitemap that goes inside that SDK, SDK, and then that SDK actually captures the user actions and does the job of calling data cloud for you. So your application backend is not really, maybe it's an addition to this, it's doing something, but the job of pushing data to data cloud is handled by the SDK on your application UI. So it's not the backend. Um, there is a latency different, uh, difference. The profile profile data is transmitted in a similar latency, so both uh, surface and data cloud in three minutes. However, the engagement data for the SDK uh, will only show up around 15 minutes later. 
where it sits the same for ingestion API around three minutes. Um, a great feature of the web SDK is that it comes with consent management built in. Um, so you can you can write functions in your JavaScript SDK to to uh, manage consent. So the typical use case, you know, you have a cookie banner, and then when the user interacts with it, you can update your SDK to tell it to whether to transmit data or what data to transmit to data cloud, and your SDK will honor those customer requests. Whereas if you go to ingestion API, you might have to custom build it or find a library or a framework that does that for you. It also handles identity tracking by uh, by default. So SDK will manage the cookies for you, which not only handles consent, but also identity tracking, meaning if somebody visits your website or your mobile app for the first time, they will be considered anonymous and their data will be transmitted to data cloud in an anonymous fashion, uh, meaning the user will be flagged as anonymous. But whenever they identify themselves in the website, you can write logic to merge those profiles. And that's also handled by the SDK. The ingestion API uses a YAML schema, like we'll see later, whereas the web SDK uses a JSON structure to um, for the sitemap. Okay, let's dive into the use case. Um, we have a financial services client with a mobile app that allows customers to deposit cash into their accounts. It also allows them to, of course, to sign up and log in to manage their accounts. Um, but the primary engagement there is to link banks and then deposit cash into the account. We have, going from left to right now, we have enterprise data that is hosted in Amazon S3. And this includes broad customer demographic data. This, this, this could overlap with the mobile users or not completely. Um, it could also be distinct. Um, and then we have contact and subscriber data in Salesforce, one in the CRM, one in the SFMC. SFMC also hosts data regarding email engagement. And then like, like we're talking about, the mobile contains mobile app data, only the data that pertains to the user, user base of the mobile app. All right, so, whoops. Let's dive deeper into that mobile app data because that will be the focus of today's session. We wanna track specific user activity on the mobile app, especially users' progress during these onboarding step. Onboarding in our use case means they sign up and then they agree to terms, which means their financial account has been created. They also provide an SSN in there. And then they link a bank, they deposit some, some amount. If, they, if a customer does all of that, we consider them to be fully onboarded, right? So here there might be a question. This is a mobile app. We could have used mobile SDK. So why ingestion API? Um, the one thing that I missed, to, I missed to cover in here is a use case. Now let's talk about it here instead. Um, mobile SDK or web SDK mostly is used to capture user activities in the page. Right. Think about normal user activities, and this is very similar to how marketing cloud personalization worked or works. Um, if you are used to that, if you want to track user activities like clicking buttons, um, watching viewing posts, watching videos, um, link clicks, you know, uh, adding to cart, things like that. So activities that you do on the page, then you'll use mobile or web SDK because the sitemap tells. Uh, data cloud or the SDK where exactly things are, what elements exist, where the links are, where the buttons are, where the form fields are. And then these activity is transmitted to data cloud. Whereas here, we don't want to do that. Our use case, we do not want to track, um, we don't want to track what buttons they clicked, you know, what pages they are on. We want to track a specific activities in their, in their journey. So did they sign up? Have they linked a bank? Have they deposited any cash? And whenever they deposit cash, we want to know this. And all of this information comes into our backend, right? Our backend is the source of truth in this case because it handles all, um, it validates all user data. So we can't just, just because they click deposit, we can't be sure that they actually deposited. It was easier to do all of these things in the backend with ingestion API than with mobile SDK in the front end. Um, so in this, 
Um, we, we are collecting a bunch of data from that back end. We collect every time a user signs up, uh, like we are talking about before, opens an account, links a bank, deposits cash, or logs in. Um, we are tracking those. And there is some overlapping setup profile versus engagement, and we'll dive, dive deeper into this in, in later slides. But for now, let's understand that these are the activities that we're tracking. And the activities in the on the solid box affect the user's profile, right? So whenever a user signs up, they are providing the profile in the first place. So that updates our profile. If they open a financial account, link a bank or deposit cash, we flag them as a profile change because now they have become a different kind of customer. They have progressed through their onboarding step. Whereas when a user logs in, it's just an engagement activity. There is no profile being updated. They are simply logging in. Um, okay. And we'll see this um, live in a bit. That's why I have a demo button in there. Now, um, data connector and stream setup. Before we set that up, we will plan the ingestion. Right, or we should plan the ingestion. Gathering data and gathering data inventory and planning for ingestion is important, especially in data cloud integrations. And of course, planning is important in any implementation. However, in data cloud, if we don't plan and if we make mistakes, it's especially hard to undo those mistakes at later stages of the pipeline. So if you wrongly ingested data, um, customer data, and then through later stages, right? You map those data. And then through in segment creation, if you realize that your ingestion, there's some problems with the ingestion, more often than not, you have to redo all of those steps. So you have to delete your segmentation. Um, you have to also delete those mappings. And I think speakers from last week, um, Kyle and Matthew, when they talked about lessons learned, they, they went over this a little bit. Uh, more often than not, you have to you have to delete stuff. And that matters because one, that's extra work. Uh, two, it also impacts your credit consumption. So if you had brought in all, all customer data by any chance, then you have to re-ingest all of them. And then like we saw before, data pipelines cost credits. So you are um, you are doubling your credits consumption by not planning, not planning ingestion properly. So to plan the ingestion, it is recommended to prepare a thorough document, sometimes called a data dictionary or just a data inventory that lists all the data sources, ingestion methods, you know, required transformations. What is your use case? Uh, put that out down in paper, Excel, uh, whatever your preferred method is. And this should be very detailed. It should include the relationship between data. It should include data types and exactly what um, what data model object these things are being mapped to. Everything from front to back ideally will be mapped. And also explore if it is possible to filter and sanitize data before they are ingested. The idea here is to minimize the number of rows that you're bringing to data cloud. Um, to, for two reasons, one, uh, like I keep mentioning, credits consumption, that is, um, that depends on the volume of data ingested, which is volume of data ingested and also volume of rows processed for later stages of the pipeline. And minimal data is better than a lot of uh, data that could clog your pipeline. And at this stage, since we have all the requirements set down in a tool of our choosing, we can also consider now the API limits because for example, ingestion API, you can only have 250 API calls per second from all of the ingestion API connectors. So if you have five different ingestion API, um, API set up in your data cloud for five different use cases, five different applications, then only 250 can come from all of them per second. And in your, if in your document, you see that data sources are bringing in more than that, now you have to, you need to have a strategy to handle all of that, right? Maybe you queue data before they come in and things like that. So you'll be aware of all of that. And you can also uh, you can also in detail estimate the credit consumptions and then think about your plan, data cloud partnership and, and stuff like that. And of course you wanna create a small subset of data from all the sources. 
during development and testing phases because data cloud can only be activated in prod environments, uh, not in sandbox. As far as I know, I don't know if that has changed. Things move pretty quick in data cloud. So please, please uh, take a look at the official documentation. Okay, now that we have the ingestion planned, we are ready to set up connector. And we'll talk through the connector and stream setup really quickly, and then we'll move into the platform and see uh, some of the setups that setup that we have done. Yeah. So while setting up, setting up a connector, what this means is that you are connecting the data sources. So you're connecting data cloud, in our case, to our mobile app. You're not really connecting yet to the data, data themselves, but only to the source. And so it only makes the objects available for ingestion. You are not really setting up the um, streams themselves, which we'll do in the, in the next slide. And the schema, your, your data model for that app, at least the ones that you want to pull in, is we, we tell Data Cloud the schema using a YAML file. This defines all the DSOs. So remember, we have three different objects in Data Cloud, the primary ones at least, the data source objects or DSOs, the data lake objects, DLOs, and the data model objects, DMOs. And this YAML schema defines the DSOs, meaning the data model of the source object in this case, the data model object of the data that will come in from the mobile app. And in this schema, if you look at the right, the first figure in here, it needs to be a OpenAI 3.0 specification. Actually, you don't need to know what these necessarily mean. Um, the important part is inside the schemas, um, schemas category or property where we'll, we'll have all the objects that we want to ingest. So for example, here we have user sign up, account creation, bank link, cash deposit, and user login. These are all the activities. These are all the data, all the objects that we want to ingest into Data Cloud. So we are making Data Cloud aware that these are coming in or this could potentially come in. And um, in, this, in this property, you will have, and we'll see this, uh, We'll see this later, the full schema file. We will define all the fields, for example, for user sign up and their associated data type. And this, this is how Data Cloud builds the DSO, DSO data model. Right. So here the spec only the spec defines more than the schema, which you can see in the right, which you can download after we create a connector, and we'll see this very soon. We can download the full schema, which is the real API specification from our connector setup. Um, so Salesforce, when you apply, when you supply a YAML schema to Salesforce, it will inject your YAML specification to a much larger specification file, which we can see on the right. So this has more information, some metadata about your connector, some info, title. It also uh, it also tells you what the server is, what the API endpoint is to call and all the paths that you can that you can make your API calls for. And they map one on one with the schema that you have provided. Okay. And I also wanted to briefly mention that new objects and fields can always be added to the schema by updating the schema, but you cannot really modify existing fields and objects. Um, we we have a slide for that. Um, so if you make a mistake in the schema, what the options the options that you have, and more often than not, you do not. This comes back to making mistakes um, multiple times. Even in our POC build, we had to delete a stream and then recreate it, which would be disastrous if we already had millions of customer data in there. Okay, so let's also talk through the data stream setup. Once we have the connector set up, now we can actually create new streams based on this object that we that we uploaded. So if I want to create a stream for account creation, for example, so every time somebody creates an account, I want to know, but I want to push that data into Data Cloud, then we would do that. Um, and in this in this stage, we can create additional formula fields, and uh, Salesforce also injects its own formula fields um, that are system generated. 
And together, your the schema that you provided in the YAML, the formula fields that you create during data stream setup, and all the added formula fields, the system generated formula fields, these together make up the schema for the DLO. DLO is a data lake object that actually sits in the uh, data cloud data lake. That is the difference between DSO and DLO. DSO is the schema for the raw data that you bring in from any sources, in this case, ingestion API and mobile app, whereas DLO is the data that's actually sitting in data lake and that will be used to in later stages, for example, data modeling, and includes the formula fields that you add in here. And primary key and a proper category, primary key must be selected at the stage and also a proper category must be assigned. So let's dive deeper into the categories for our um, for our objects that we ingested, that we deferred earlier. Here, um, the profile versus engagement, and there's also other category, but let's focus on profile and engagement here. Um, so streams with any identification information, you know, name, email address, these map to the profile category. Um, so pretty much streams that make up a customer's profile maybe partially, but they do make, make make up the profile. And stream that directly tie into events. This could be customer events, like in our case, linking a bank account, depositing cash, logging in, or it could be, um, like I mentioned earlier, it could be weather events, with some sort of real time events that's happening outside. Um, also one way to think about these is that profile stream attributes um, are the attributes that can be used to create identity resolution rule sets. So if you have in a stream, if you have attributes that will help create a customer identity, that's most likely a profile attribute. Whereas if you have um, an event or a customer engagement data coming in and you can do things, you can think about aggregated statistics like logins per week or total deposit per month, then most likely that's an engagement category. And anything that doesn't fit into any of this is gonna be the other category that we chose to ignore in here. Okay, so in our case, we have the user sign up, opening up the account, linking a bank and depositing cash. These directly influence the customer profile for us because we have Boolean fields that will change when, uh, when the customer progresses through their onboarding step. So we are changing the profile, updating customer profile. So all of this will be captured by a profile stream, whereas login and the act of depositing cash, the act of linking a bank and the act of opening the account are also engagements. So they will also be additionally be captured by engagement streams. That's why there is an overlapping, uh, overlapping set in here. Okay, now actually let's go to the platform and see a few things because I've been talking for a while and there were a lot of text in the slides. Um, so connector setup. Actually, before that, let's look at the let's look at the app and the user flow. So we have a mobile app here, and we have a few test users to to demonstrate how the typical onboarding step would work. Um, we have uh, Philip Jones, the customer who's already signed up. So now after they sign up, when they log in, this is what they will see. They have to enter the SSN, you know, um, I'm gonna pick a random number in here and then they pick what kind of account they would like. Let's pick a crypto account. And then they have to agree to these terms before their financial account will be created. Now a real financial services would probably ask for more information than this but this works for our demo purposes. Now, when they agree and then they create account, now their account is created. Um, you see, there is no, there's no balance, of course, they haven't linked the bank. So now they will be at least be able to get into the dashboard. Now, uh, at this point, they are one step through in their onboarding process, right? They created their account, but now they also have, sorry, they created their login information. So the mobile app account, they also created the financial account. Now they can link the bank through here. Um, so discover um, random numbers. Now their bank is linked. And now finally they can deposit some money. So $34, there we go. And I'm showing this because we also have a debug panel here that we'll be looking at just in a bit. But this is the, this is the typical customer flow that we expect. And we want to capture the checkpoint 
uh, activities. At this point, Philip Jones here should be fully onboarded. Now let's go and see the setup on the data cloud side. So if we go and go to the ingestion API part of the configuration, we will see the bootcamp mobile app stream. And I apologize for the misnomer here. This is not really a stream. As we talked about before, this is a connector. So maybe this could have been called a connector or just bootcamp mobile app is fine. Um, in this connector, we have uploaded a schema and we can see the full schema in here. So let's start with the user sign up. During user sign up, we have a lot of fields that we're tracking. Um, some of these will be empty because when they sign up, they won't have any account type, right? They obviously wouldn't have bank link. So all of these will be false by default, but we still wanna capture that because this will be the same stream that will be used to update that profile later. So these will be turned, these will turn into true and account type will be populated as they move on through the onboarding step or when they update their profile. And we have things like login, you can see pretty minimal things that we're capturing because we only wanna know the fact that they logged in. Uh, we don't wanna know their profile because we can always join that in data cloud. And similar things with cash deposit or bank link or account creation, all of these are engagement. And whenever something happens with the profile, we use the user sign up stream to update their profile. Okay, so once we have this set up and the full schema that I was talking about earlier, uh, you can get that by downloading all object endpoints. This will, uh, this will download the entire specification that includes the path, the connector um, and the objects that you might have set up as a stream. So let's go and look at the streams that we have set up. And again, let's start with the sign up. So during sign up, we will see a few more fields here. You can see all of the fields in here that we just saw in the connector. You know, first name has agreed terms or not. Um, the, the phone number, state, all of the information that we captured. But we also have some additional fields, the formula fields that we have created. Um, so for example, we have a country field here that is that is simply United States because we know all of our customers will be uh, from United States. So this could be this could be a way to augment your data to add something to your data set without changing your API or the backend. But at some point we realized, oh, we didn't send country information, but we really needed it to map. So instead of changing the data stream, sorry, the data connector, and then changing the logic in the mobile app, we decided to add a country field in here so that our DSO doesn't include it, but our DLO does. And DLO is the one that matters for modeling and later stages anyways. So we augmented our data using these formula fields. And another one was required. So this composite key, also sometimes called a fully qualified key was created. Um, custom by us, so we are adding this string mobile app to all the user IDs from our app. Um, and this is um, this is a usual practice, this is required and um, this is required to make distinct the users that might come, the same users that might come into data cloud through different streams. Right. So for example, if the same user with the same user ID comes from the mobile app and also through the CRM somehow, then they both will have the same ID. And uh, Michelle might get more into this during mapping because this becomes important during mapping. And we decided to add a qualifier of mobile app to everything that's coming in from mobile app, all the IDs that's coming in from the stream. And we add another qualifier like CRM contact or something like that from all the streams that's coming from the CRM. Another use case for formula fields. Um, and we can always add new formula fields by clicking on the new formula field. And if we updated our schema by going to the connector, then we, we can click on sync schema to actually bring in the new objects or new fields that we might have added. Okay. All right. So at this point, we have we have the ingestion planned. 
we have our connector set up, we have our data stream set up. Now data cloud is totally ready to receive API calls. However, Salesforce is not, right? So data cloud sits behind Salesforce, meaning that data cloud APIs are protected. So you need some sort of authorization authentication to happen before you can call data cloud APIs. Not everybody, it's not public, right? We wouldn't want that. So to do that, we would need to set up the connected app to authorize our external application to make these API calls. And um, so before doing that, let's go and see all of that, all of that data stream that's being pulled in from the app. I want to do this demo before we go into the connected app setup. Um, okay, so I'm going to log out Philip and I'm going to open the debug panel. Let's see that for now. And I'm going to log in Evelyn, who's also a similar customer like Philip before. They should not have created any. Sorry, typed that wrong. Okay. So you can see that as soon as Evelyn logged in, we have we have a lot of information in the beginning, but we haven't talked about the connected app yet. So let's ignore that for now. Let's start on this one. I don't know if this is completely visible. Um, so we have a debug log that explains exactly what's happening. We are streaming this data. As soon as somebody logged in, when Evelyn logged in, we streamed this data to Data Cloud. And this is the endpoint we used. And why this endpoint? Because our connector name, is bootcamp mobile app stream and our stream name is user login. This means that we are using the connector and then the user login stream to pass in the information that Evelyn just logged in. So these are all the information that we're passing. Um, we saw this also in the connector setup earlier, the mobile ID, the timestamp time stamp of login, transaction ID, meaning this is a unique engagement transaction ID. Um, the user ID for Evelyn and then the email for Evelyn. And now let's see similar thing happening when they uh, when they go through this, this step. Let's leave that as brokers, agree to terms again, and create account. Now the same flow happened, but now you can see that since we changed the profile, not only the engagement data went through, so this is engagement because they just created an account. So they somehow engaged with our application. So we're sending this engagement data similar to login but in addition, we're also sending in the profile data, the full profile data, because something changed now, which is the has agreed terms. It was false when they signed up. We didn't really show that step here. We started from the login step, but it should make sense that they wouldn't have agreed terms during sign up. And now that has changed from false to true. Now let's see one, one more when we link the bank again. Um, When they link the bank again, the profile data will change again. And in this case, we now have the bank name populated and also the bank linked has turned to true. The cash deposited, as you can see, is still false, which will change when we deposit cash. Um, okay, so that's how, that's how this is happening. And we already have connected apps set up here. Of course, that's why we are able to make these API calls. Again, uh, if you want to dive deep into how to set that, those up, how to set up the connector in more detail, please join the um, hands-on session on Thursday, same time. Um, okay, I think we have some time. So I'll quick, quickly run through the connected app setup without going much into detail. So like I was saying before, there needs to be some authentication authorization happening before our external application can make calls to the Salesforce platform. And when we looked at the diagram for the batch and stream, we had a simplified view. We had the API service directly connecting to data cloud, but that's not how it works. We have the integration user that will sit between our application backend and our Salesforce core platform and data cloud platform. Um, and while setting up the connected app, what we're doing is we are we are authorized first. We are authorizing the application backend, and we're also enabling the OAuth settings so that our integration user that will also create in this process to access that connected app 
And then the integration user will also have further authorization context. They will also be able to access data cloud. They will also be able to access the data space that you want them to access. And, um, and then the integration user will be used by the external application to get access tokens for the sales, Salesforce core and also to the data cloud off core. Um, the, there are two blocks on the right because data cloud, the instance of data cloud doesn't really sit on the core. That's why you need, you kind of need two access tokens, uh, one for the core platform to, um, that will be verified by the connected app and one for the data cloud off core that actually allows you to use the um, REST API endpoints. Okay, I think um, I also have, I also have a slide for the flow, but I don't think we'll get to that today. Um, maybe we'll make a different session out of that or we'll include explanations in the upload. We'll, we'll think about that. Um, I wanted to mention the API limitations. I think talked about some of this before, but uh, be mindful in ingesting large volume of records as service is cal service uses is calculated based on the volume of records uh, that's streamed into the system and also for obvious performance reasons. Um, and there are a few other uh, limitations that, um, these are only limitations for the streaming, by the way. So there are also limitations for the batch API. Um, I have put them in the resources, so please refer to them um, if you need to look at them. So we have maximum of 250 requests. Um, per per second for all API endpoints. And this is not, <clears throat> so excuse me, there are some hard limits and soft limits in data cloud. Um, a hard limit is a limit that you can't really exceed. Your, your request will simply fail if you exceed that limit. Whereas soft limits, for example, the 250 requests per second, I think is a soft limit. So if you actually end up sending say to 60 requests per second, then you will get a 429 response code, which means it just suggests your app reduce its frequency. And um, I actually do not know how this works, but I think if you do not, if you do not agree to those suggestions, then maybe it will become a hard limit at some point, right? But you don't need to worry about it getting to 251, for example, some seconds. But there are hard limits. Like I think you can only upload 150 megabytes of CSV file for bats which is a hard limit, so you can't do 151. Um, okay, and the payload size, payload size is the size of the data that you're passing in the JSON. Like we saw before, we are passing, we're pass passing this whole payload, which has mobile app ID created, all that stuff. And that size, the size of that, the total size of that payload, that data, that JSON object cannot exceed 200 kilobytes. And we have talked about this before. The latency is about three minutes. Um, the data cloud job runs every two minutes, but there might be other system things going on. So it might take up till three minutes for the data to surface according to the official documentations. One last thing I wanted to cover is about the mistakes in the ingestion schema. Um, so if you miss an object or a field, then that's the easiest thing you can just upload an updated schema. And in that updated schema, and I think we saw that earlier, right? So if we go in here, uh, we can just click on update schema and then upload a new file. It's as simple as that. And in that new file, if you are adding new fields, all the existing fields for the object, object must also be present, present. So for example, if I were adding to this, uh, to this stream, if I were also adding another thing, for example, owns, um, uh, owns bonds or something like that, right? So something about that customer is a Boolean field, then I need to also include all of these fields in the YAML schema, not only that. Um, however, if, if an object is not being updated, it doesn't really have to be part of that scheme. So if I'm only updating this um, this, this object, um, this stream that you just sign up, then I don't need to include the other streams like link a bank or cash deposit. However, now, uh, now, the crucial part is that if you got the data type wrong, you cannot change it. Uh, we actually have made a mistake uh, in ours, but the first point is that the mistake was innocuous, meaning that not all mistakes need to be changed in here. Uh, for example, a text field can be mapped with either text, email, phone, or URL. This might change uh, over time, or this might change according to a use case, but for us, it was innocuous. Our email field, 
we can look at that real quick is not, um, how do we view that? So Notice it before our user email is text. However, data cloud does have an email data type or more specifically, it's a data format within the text data type. Um, we should have used email, but apparently you can connect a text field to an email field in the data mapping stage. So we were fine. We didn't need to change anything. However, if you have wrongly configured the data type, so a number to an email, for, for example, I don't think that can happen, but please refer to the documentation uh, that tells you what fields can be mapped to what DMOs. Then it'll cause problems uh, in your DMOs and maybe in later stages. Um, now you can delete the connector and recreate it if you have if you have caught the mistake early on. So if you haven't mapped anything, then that's a little bit of wasted effort, but not not too much. Um, or another another good thing to do would be to create a formula field that will cast the original field to the appropriate data type. So for example, if text and email were not appropriate, then we could cast our text type because there are data type conversion um, functions in your formula fields. Then you can use some of that to, um, to map from a text data type to email or from number to text, um, things like that. Or you can add a new field like we did for our country. All right, so I think that's the session. We have um, some resources lined up here for the things that you might want to look further into. That is it. Thanks for joining the session. Um, I hope it was informative. And if you have any questions, please uh, put them in chat. Uh, we're almost at time, so I don't know if I'll be able to answer it today, but I'll make sure to put them up with the slides when we upload them to the YouTube channel. And we can also cover some of that in the hands-on session. Thank you very much, Sandesh. Um, so we will be sharing the recording on the slide deck soon. And uh, there was a question about the hands-on session. So the hands-on session will be this Thursday. And maybe uh, there will be two or more hands-on sessions for this specific session. And for the next sessions as well, the one uh, coming up next week and next week by Michelle and Tim as well, there are some hands-on sessions planned. So uh, make sure that you have joined the group or you are following the Slack notifications. Whenever we publish the event, you will get notified and you will uh, you can register to that and you will get automated notifications as well. So uh, the plan is uh, to have the hands-on session on this Thursday and if required, Friday as well. And any questions, feel free to unmute or let me know or in the chat. Yeah, I don't see any other questions, Sandesh. So we can monitor the Slack channel and if there are any other questions, we can take it there. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Sandesh. Thanks, everyone. Bye.